Welcome to season 11 of the Parenting Aces podcast, a proud member of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and this week I am chatting with coach Marcelo Ferreira. Marcelo is a former top junior from Brazil who came to the U.S. to play college tennis at Georgia College, went on to coach there and at Texas Tech before becoming the head men's coach at Pepperdine University, which is where he and I met when my son was going through his own recruiting process. So I'm excited to have Marcelo chatting with us about junior tennis development college tennis, and how the two intertwine. Before I bring him on, however, I want to just remind you, if you're not already, we'd love to have you join us as a premium member. And all you have to do is go to parentingaces.com, click on the join button, and it's easy as that. If you're not interested in joining full-fledged, but would like to take advantage of one-on-one consults with yours truly, you can do that through the shop tab at parentingaces.com. So for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Coach Marcelo Ferreira. Hey, Marcelo, it's so great to see you. It's been a while. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Lisa. It really has been a while. I know. I When you moved to Atlanta, I, I have to tell this story because it was so funny. I was out practicing with one of the teams I was playing on in Atlanta, and somebody said to me, have you met the new coach here? Um, he just moved here from Southern California. I know you've got some connections in Southern California. His name's Marcelo. I was like, Marcelo? Marcelo Ferreira? <laughs> And there you were on a court teaching, and I yelled over, and you were like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was so crazy, so crazy. But I'm, I'm thrilled to get you on the pod and um, really excited for you to share your story and your expertise with our audience. And so to get us started, as I do with every new guest that comes on this show, can you tell us a little bit about your tennis story, how you got started in the game? Sure, sure. I'll try to summarize it. It's a, it's a, I would say a little bit of a unique story. Um, as you know, but a lot of people don't, I'm from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I grew up in a very humble family. So I actually got into tennis as a ball boy, you know, back home due to a lot of poverty and I guess a lot of the labor laws not being really applied. A lot of the 9, 10, 11 year olds, they'll go to these different academies to work as a full time ball boy is not a ball boy like we see at tournaments they just go and work at the tournament so i got this job to work from 1 p.m to 11 p.m every day just being at the academy and clients would come like lisa stone would come in i want to take a private lesson the front desk people would be would you like marcelo to be your ball boy for a dollar so it gave me the opportunity to make my own money at, at the age 11 um and eventually i fell in love with the, with, with the game got to watch a lot of coaches coach the entire day. So I'll try to absorb and process information. And my hitting partner was the wall for years. Uh, as I got better, the owner of the academy noticed my improvement, started inviting me to jump into some of his lessons and hit, hit some balls with his students, started playing tournaments. Uh, by, by the age of 15 to 16, I got my coaching certification with the Brazilian Confederation. So I started coaching at a very early age, um, playing tournaments at the same time, trying to go to college at age 18. I actually went to college for three years to get my physical education degree there before I moved to America. And then when I was playing a challenger tournament, uh, I had a scout watching me and he came up to me after the match to ask me if I was interested in playing college tennis which at that time I had no idea what that even meant. Uh, just, you know, this humble guy from Brazil, growing up as a ball boy, what, what is college tennis? Had never left the country, didn't speak the language. So he went through the entire process with me. Unfortunately, after I decided to go, September 11th uh, okay. happened. Uh, so my parents told me, you gotta pump the brakes, we're gonna stop the process. And then I ended up coming to college, to Georgia College here in Milledgeville, Georgia, in 2002, uh, it was an adventure. You know, again, it was the first time leaving the country. I really could not order McDonald's. You know, the, the English was completely broken. So it was challenging, but it, it really made me grow as a man big time. I fell in love with the country. 
fell in love with college tennis, which got me to stay as an assistant at Georgia College after I graduated. Uh, realized that that's what I really wanted to do. And the path was open for me to come to Texas Tech, spend, I believe, seven years with, with Coach Tim Siegel over there, and then went over to Pepperdine um, for another six years. And I've been here in Atlanta for the past three years now. So I have to say, we met when you came to Pepperdine. Um, you took over the, the head coach position there. It was during my son's recruiting years, and he was very interested at Pepperdine in Pepperdine and, you know, had been spending a lot of time there. Sadly, it didn't work out for him to come play with you. My husband said, you have to ask him if he regrets not recruiting Morgan <laughs> to Pepperdine. <laughs> But y'all crossed paths when Morgan was in college and oh, yeah. his team played your team and and he beat one of your players. And I yes, remember he, he you reached that. out to me after that. I think it was the only win. That's why yeah. I reached out to you. But you just see how amazing life is. You know, like we crossed paths and things didn't work out, but we connected. You know, I really liked Morgan from the get-go and you. And we stayed in touch since, you know, yeah. we ran into each other in Atlanta and here we are talking again. And yes, we, I had the opportunity to coach against him when we came to Boise. Uh, we, we took him pretty badly that day, Yeah. But, but Morgan took care of his court and won his match. Yeah. Yeah. That was awesome. Um, and now you're back in Atlanta. You are running your own high performance tennis Academy at the Windy Hill athletic club, which is in Cobb County for those familiar with the Atlanta area. And really what I want to focus on today, Marcelo is what in your mind is the biggest difference in developing a junior player to his or her fullest potential versus as a college coach working with college players who want to develop further so that they can have a chance to play professional tennis and earn a living that way? Well, I guess, you know, there, there are plenty of differences, right? And sure. we'll, we'll try to touch on them just briefly. When, when, when you're coaching a junior player, regardless of the age, but when I think about the kids that I've been working with from age eight, nine, all the way to 17, uh, I, I like to think about a proper developmental ladder when, you, when you're working with these kids. And even though all of these different facets of the game, they intertwine, um, I feel like when these kids come to us, there's a lot of technical work that needs to be addressed. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these kids, whether it's, it's coming from the family or coming from the coaches themselves, it's, the focus is a, a lot on winning. Mm -hmm. So because they're so, and I understand a lot of times where the coaches are coming from, they want to make sure that the results are coming so they can keep the clients. Sure. But a lot of times throughout that process, because you're focusing a lot more on the results, so much it gets compromised, including technique. So uh, I'm a very technical guy and so is the rest of my staff. So we focus a lot on technique. Uh, we try to focus a lot on, on movement efficiency and getting these kids to understand that as important as technique is, uh, they need to be able to move properly and work on anticipation to be able to get to those shots and apply the proper technique that they're learning. Um, consistency, I would say, comes in third place. When they're moving properly, they're hitting the ball better, let's be able to really make a lot of balls. Uh, and strategy and power come, in, in, in my opinion, in those orders. I feel like we have a lot of these kids that you have one side of the equation, kids that are pushing balls all over the place to win matches and other kids that are just banging balls all over the place, burning a lot of those stages. And they just think tennis is about hitting winners. So I think first is really forming and molding that th those players when it comes from a technical and movement perspective. The other thing is making sure for me, coming from the, the college world, what we're trying to build is kids that understand the meaning of being selfless. Tennis is a very selfish sport, okay? And we know that in college, that is not going to fly, right? It's all about playing for each other, caring for each other. You play like a family. But academies, to no fault of their own, we're focusing on the individual. So here, I'm really trying to develop these kids' understanding that if they give their all to their teammates, 
they're going to make their teammates play better tennis, which eventually is going to get them to become better players as well. Uh, so there's that selflessness and that ability to really care for each other is a big component of our uh, program. I don't know if you saw, but your camera went out. Uh oh, sorry. There uh, I am, and so, and dogs are barking. It's a little chaotic. I I apologize. <laughs> so 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 that that um understanding of playing for each other, understanding the importance. We, we, we talk a lot about college and I want these kids to really come to college a little bit more prepared. Uh, understanding also the parents is, is something that is in juniors a lot more than in college. They're a lot more involved in the, in the player's career, which is okay. You know, parents are part of the team. They are part of the team. There's no doubt. And I actually welcome them to be part of the team, but it's really important from the get-go that they know their role and they know the coach's role. Um, so, so that's something that I feel like it's been missing in the industry. And a lot of it, Lisa, is unfortunate and it stems from the financial aspect of the business. The more that all these coaches have the right intentions, but a lot of times they end up not doing it afraid of losing the clients. Mm -hmm. So I urge my parents and I urge all the parents listening to this, Yes, be involved because you're the one making the financial commitment, but you're hiring a coach because you trust that that coach is going to do the job. Let him or her do the job. So we, we, we go through that process, understanding uh, competition and the best tournaments to play. Uh, there's no perfect formula, but it, it, it takes understanding of what is the best way to develop a player and, what, and how he, can the player be best developed playing this tournament. I see a lot of parents that want to put their their kids in the toughest tournaments ever, because if they lose, there's always that cop out. Whoa, he lost first round because he played very good players. And then you also have the other way where my some of the players just want to play level sixes and win them all. But are you really developing? Mm -hmm. So finding that perfect balance. So we're trying to really attack their development from all different angles. We have a full-time mental coach that works with us. And obviously, depending on the ages that she's working with, because we got eight to 17, is a different message. But we understand that the game nowadays is, and it has, has always been, but so mental, so mental. Back in the days, Dr. Lemon was even telling us, he played for Minnesota. He said, we never even talked about the possibility of having a sports psychologist. And now it's so important, not only because of what the game requires, but we know social media is playing a big role, which we also try to educate our players big time on that. Um, but but Ali Clayton, our, our uh, mental coach, she's been doing a heck of a job just getting these kids to really embrace the process without focusing on the outcome to try to think a little bit more long-term and understand that with this game, if we do things right today, they might just really see the benefits of that five years from now. Right. And it, and it can be frustrating at times, man, I'm putting all my sweat into this and you're telling me just in five years, well, players develop at different paces. So that's why when a parent comes to me, well, my daughter was beating that girl last year. Now this girl is beating her all the time. Well, maybe there's something that we can do to make sure that she gets back on track. But a lot of times she is on the right track. That girl that just has a, maybe a motor development, cognitive or whatever it is, development that is going at a faster pace than your daughter and son now, you know? And you've been around tennis for a long time, Lisa. How many times, <laughs> how many times you've seen a kid that in 16s was a nobody and then in 18s, one of the top recruits and then vice versa, you see kids who are number, top five in 14s and 16s playing a style that is not going to be feasible and sustainable for 18s. Right. So coaches don't have the perfect formula. It's important for parents to understand that I truly believe I don't want to underrate what we do, but I truly believe that players are responsible for 70, if no more percent of their career. Yeah. Our 20 to 30% is very important, but at the end of the day is what they bring. Okay, right. coaches can do a lot when it comes to molding the player, but if you are lazy, sluggish, uncoachable, you can bring 
Tony Nadal, Carlos Moya, Patrick Morataglu, is not going to make any difference because the kid doesn't want it. Mm -hmm. um, then when you transfer over to, to college, you have the goods and the bads. In, the, in my case, I was fortunate enough to coach a lot of really top players because Texas Tech and Pepperdine had really solid teams. Those kids are talking about professional tennis. Right. So they come with a completely different drive. They're, for the most part, more professional. Uh, they're driven. Obviously, you have you know, the exception to the rule. They, they want to be pushed. But with those kids, a lot of the challenges is personality management because you're bringing kids from different cultures mm -hmm. and you're trying to get them to play for one another, play for the same, same team, play for the same mission. Uh, and because you have this pot of a bunch of top ITF and ATP players, so there's a little bit of ego, uh, which is okay. You know, like you want these kids to think I should be playing number one. So that's why managing the personality and making sure that they understand the number one and number six has the same importance. Uh, breaking bad habits that maybe they picked up coming up to college, whether it was the way they practiced or something that the coaches or parents told them it was okay to do. So breaking those bad habits, protecting them from the college life. You know, college is really, really good, but we know, we know that <laughs> it's also really, really fun. <laughs> we, know, we know these kids are going to be exposed yeah. to a lot of things that could be very beneficial for the tennis career, but very detrimental. So as a college coach, you almost become the parent because all of these kids that I'm coaching now, mom and dad pick them up at seven o'clock. I'm responsible for these kids in college, whether it's okay, I'm struggling in school. I just broke up with my girlfriend. I got into a fight at the bar last night. You know, so all of those things, they impact the way they're practicing and the results sure, that sure. we're having. So you're not too concerned. Obviously, there's always some technical work, but when the kid was able to establish himself to that level of tennis, the technical work is very minute, okay? You're not really trying to change somebody who's playing so well, and you don't want to get into the kid's head too much because it's tough matches every week, every week. So we try to make some of those adjustments in the off season during the fall. So it's decision-making and strategy, really getting them to play a bigger game, mm -hmm. understanding that in juniors, you might get away grinding a little bit and playing more defensive tennis. In college, it's not gonna work, okay? That doesn't mean that you gotta pound every ball and go for winners, but you need to learn how to hold the baseline better. You need to take time and space away from, from the opponent a little bit better. Uh, recovery is a major thing that a lot of these kids didn't have in juniors right. because the load of training is so high. They, they'll come for an individual at seven, then they come in for two hours or three hours of tennis and fitness. So making sure they're doing their recovery, they're doing, you know, their ice bath. Um, but it's really more of management on one side of the, the coin and more coaching on the other side of the coin. A little bit of mix uh, with both, but I would say when you look at it from outside, I feel like that's who I was more on this side, more of a like, okay, let's mentor these kids, let's keep them together, let's make sure they understand the culture of the program. But then from a coach's perspective, really like the personal coach's perspective, when you are in college, you're supposed to act a different way because results truly determine the future of your career. Right. You know, so as, as, and, and I want Marcel, I want to just stop you there because this is important for everybody to hear for a college coach <laughs> results determine the future of their career. That that's a big statement. And it is something that, you know, as a junior coach, you just said you're trying to not focus on results and trying to get right. the parents and the kids not to focus on results. But once they're in college, results are it. That's what matters. Yes. And yes. as the college coach, your career is on the line every time your players go out to compete. No doubt. No doubt. And it is, you know, like we, we, we thrive as coaches, you thrive on that because that's what you signed up for. Of course. But there's gotta be, but there's gotta be an understanding between coaches and players and the, the uh, athletic department because everybody wants is fighting for the same goal, 
but players, they come and go, right? In four years, whether they did a good job or not, they're leaving. The coach is trying to stick around for a very long time. And knowing what I got on that side, which, you know, like college, college coaching has given me everything that I have in life. Uh, I'll never say anything about that world because all the friends that I have in my career took off because of the people that I met. But I saw some of the bad habits that I had in players that came to me. And the thing is, if you focus on the process now as a junior and don't focus so much on the results, you're going to become such a tough, resilient player that when you do come to college, the results are going to be coming automatically because you know how to win the proper way. If in your junior career, you're just focusing on winning, 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 you will compromise the things that will cost you in college. Mm. Because in college, the pushing, like I told you, is not going to, it's not going to work. Right. Okay. You need to learn how to deal with pressure when you're the last match to clinch the entire thing and you got the entire school watching on the bleachers. So all of those things, what we're trying to do, our, our program is a high performance college prep. We're not reinventing the wheel. But I run this drill, this program, exactly with the same format I ran practices at Pepperdine and Texas Tech, taking into account, obviously, ages and levels, but it's all about discipline. It's discipline-driven and effort playing for each other, and it, it takes time for these kids to adjust and for the parents to be okay. Parents are not allowed to come to practice, and they get in out. I'm like, hey, you guys drop off your kids go get a drink in the lobby, you know, just let us do our job. But it's been working because we have kids now at age 12, 13 that are practicing with the same mindset and determination as a college player. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing these kids go to college and getting a call from the coach. Not to talk about results because you never know what the results are going to be. Sure. And this kid is responsible. He's a leader. He shows up on time. He pushes everybody else. And I'm surprised because I struggle and I'm speaking. I don't want to speak on behalf of every coach, but the friends that I have, they always struggle with that. Man, right. these girls, these boys are not showing up on time. You know, they're failing every class the first year, you know, and that's not the kid's fault. They're overwhelmed and they're having to deal with something that they were not taught. So mm -hmm. I have two other coaches on my staff that were college coaches. I just hired one more and I'm about to hire another one. So we want to be able to call this a college prep program where players are exposed to former college coaches. So they're really teaching them how to act today so they have the success on the other side. I love it. All right. You've, you've mentioned so many great points and I want to go back to a couple of them. The first I want to go back to is that you said that you don't want the parents present at the practice, but I know you well enough to know that that doesn't mean you want parents uninvolved in their child's tennis. So can you talk about how you communicate with the parents so that they understand what's happening during their kids' practices and exactly what their role is day to day, but also, you know, when the kid goes to play a tournament, what yeah. do you want the parents to do and how do you communicate that to the parents? Right. You know, like when it comes to parents not watching practice, I just think it has nothing to do. A lot of my parents are former division one players. They, they, they know the game, but we, we know that a lot of times a parent who played tennis, even if they don't come into practice with the intention of doing it, when they see their kid doing something wrong, there's arms moving all over the place. And I, what? I, oh yeah, I, and I've been in situations where I'm talking to the kid and the kid, one eye is on me and the other one is moving to the right or to the left. Yeah. So it, it, it breaks the rhythm sure. of practice. But my parents, they all know they are a very integral piece of the puzzle. Very, they're part of a team. So I have a group message with each mom and dad named after the family. And we exchange multiple messages. I talk to them on the phone all the time. Uh, they're the ones going to most of the tournaments, you know, like sure. we got a lot of players. So I try to go to as many as possible, but I tell them, listen, even, you know, even though you know the game really well, here's what I need you to do. Mm -hmm. Send me the summary of the match. Whether it's like 
the competitiveness was not up to par, the forehand on the run down the line wasn't good, whatever it is. But when it comes to talking to your kid, be a parent. Because I want that kid to be able to walk off the court, whether he won or lost, knowing that all he's going to hear from the dad or the mom is support. Obviously, I'm not asking those parents, and I don't want those parents to give these kids a free pass if misbehavior took place and lack of effort. No, no, no. Then you got to be a parent. You got to be a parent. Just like that kid would be misbehaving at home and they'll be giving them some tough love. But it, for me, I remember in 2020 when we were going through the peak of COVID, uh, I've been able to build a good relationship with, with Brad Gilbert when I was at Pepperdine and, and Darren Cahill as well, because Darren would drop off his son for our summer camps. So I reached out to both of them and asked them, would you guys be willing to do a Zoom session with us? And I remember Darren saying towards the end, you know, like we have probably like 80 families on the little windows. And he said, guys, I see a lot of parents. Can everybody come to the screen? And he said, listen, you guys know my resume. You know my background. That's a guy who developed three number ones in the world. And he said, my son is playing college at UNLV. And let me tell you, parents, be parents. And I could just see some of the parents like, because, hey, I, I'm thinking, you know, if I don't have a child yet, but how am I going to be as competitive as I am? Am I going to be able to live out what I preach? I hope so. I hope so. But I know it's tough. But Darren said, I wanted to be able to sit down, watch my son compete, and I'll be like, oh, my gosh, he's missing the forehand, he's missing the backhand. And he said, I would just relay some things to the coach, not telling the coach what to do, mm -hmm. but just saying, this is what I saw but let the coach be the one sure. teaching that. So it, th th there is a fine line. I got to tell you, Lisa, and that's not because I'm here on, on your podcast and some of my parents will be able to see. I'm very, very fortunate. I think it's because we set the rules when we first sit down, you know? And, and I tell them, listen, you guys are going to be part of the Windy Hill family. Never think that because we have some of these policies, you're not, you are 100% involved. And that's why I have a lot of uh, meetings with parents, with the player in it, so we can set goals, so we can try to achieve those goals. But my families are unbelievable. They really are. Uh, they, they respect their boundaries. And because of that, what happens when you feel like the families are doing their part and actually going above and beyond, you want to go above and beyond. Yeah. You want to go above your so so a couple a couple of times we have a parent that played and they show up just to drop off their, their kids and they show up in a moment that I'm giving the kids a speech or talking about something. I'll ask them to chime in and give their opinion. They feel appreciated. Sure. Uh, so I, I, I think that when a coach says, you know, listen, it's my way or the highway, it's not gonna work, it's not fair because that's their child, mm -hmm. they're the ones paying, they're the ones raising. So I just think it's important. Communication is key. If the communication and the dialogue is happening. Thank you so much for saying that. That That's the word of parenting is, is this communication. Always. You communicate. Yeah. You, know, that you leave no stones unturned. Yeah. Right. You know, like I, I have never had any issue um, confronting parents if necessary. And I, and I love the conversations, Lisa. So we, we avoid having criteria to enter our program. Some academies do that and nothing yeah. wrong, but you know, I don't mind telling a parent, oh, if I put a criteria, you must be a four or five UTR. That kid is a four one or a three nine, but I feel like he's playing at a level of a six. He's just not playing tournaments. He's going to come into my, my group. Yeah. And if a parent who is a four or five, and I think he's actually a three five, he's not going to get in. And I'll say, listen, UTR is a great tool. It's a great tool. But in my opinion, it scratches the surface. You gotta really look from a, from a bigger picture. Okay, how did that kid get, get to a three five or a four five? Uh, for me, as long as I see some of the very important values, character traits that I need for my program, and that no drills need to be modified because of the kid, mm -hmm. I'm gonna bring them in. And I have no problem telling the the, the mom and the dad that. Yeah. You know, we have the the lower group half of the lower group because we have the junior HP and the HP group the H the junior HP half of the group plays with yellow ball 
half of it with the green dog. And we just had a girl that joined us and she was playing yellow at a different academy. Mm -hmm. And when I told the mommy it was going to be green, she was at first not happy, but I told her, listen, there's nothing that a coach wants more for players to keep getting better. Right. I would love for this girl to be boom, HP, not even junior HP. Trust me, I don't think she's gonna be stuck. If you see it as stuck in green dog, I need to clean up some of her swings. And parents love to word to use the word keep up. My kids can keep up. I'm like, yes, your daughter, your son, they can keep up. What does that really mean? You know, like right. making 20 balls over the net with broken technique because the boy's traveling too fast. Is that good? Yeah, they're keeping up, but they're getting worse every practice. How and about risking slow- injury. Yes, yes. How about we slow that down? Let's play with the green dot, green dot ball, clean up the technique and move her up or move him up when they're actually ready yeah. to thrive in that group. I love that. I love that. All right. One other thing you mentioned a few minutes ago is finding the balance with tournament levels. And I know there are a lot of parents that struggle with this. I I struggled with it when my son was in juniors. How do you know what level to put them in? How do you know when it's time for them to play up in the next age group? How do you find that balance? Is there a magic formula or is it a case by case thing? There's no such a thing, you know, I think, you know, like the, the parents, they become more and more knowledgeable because here's the thing. First of all, obviously you got to take levels into consideration, but then you got to take into account the, the applicants for that tournament, right? So you, you might be thinking, oh, I don't want to play this level five because I've been playing just threes and fours. But then you look at the level of kids that signed up for the tournament, you're going to be challenged. For me, it comes down to development right? Yes, I want these kids gathering points so they're able to accumulate enough points to keep going into the higher level tournaments. Uh, But if there's a tournament here in Atlanta that's a level five and these kids are playing a lot of higher level tournaments, but you see them, man, you're on a list. You're the 15th highest UTR. There's a lot of great players that will challenge you that. I don't care if it's a level five. Stop being prideful and go play because you're going to get better and you're going to get challenged right? Uh, But if you're looking at that and you see that you're the number one seed and you're going to just sign up because you're going to win the tournament, you're going to bring a $5 trophy home. I'm against, I'm against that. So, so I truly believe that that balance, yes, you need to gather the points because without the points, the USTA points, you won't be able to enter the level twos and ones. Mm -hmm. So I want my kids to be playing a lot of those tournaments. Uh, but when I see that they're signing up for a bunch of tournaments, level six, and coming back with trophies every weekend and every match is one and one, I got to address that because it's not making anybody look good. You're not getting better. You're not right. getting better. Um, so I like when kids find a balance when it comes to not playing for kids this age, two tournaments a month, in my opinion, is very good. Mm-hmm. Very good because – I don't want them, you know, 12, 13, I don't want them to get completely burned out. Right. You know, have a social life. Like the other day, I had this kid who last year was number three in the country in 12s. Uh, he's doing a heck of a job in, in, in 14s. He comes to me and he's like, coach, um, my basketball team is in the finals. And was the final was during practice. And he said, do you mind if I go? And I said, I mind if you don't go. Yeah. I mind if you don't go. I said, bud, I feel like by by allowing you to do those things, you're going to actually end up playing tennis even harder. Yeah. Those are memories that you're not going to have all the time. Your basketball team, he went, they ended up winning. He sent me videos. He came up the next day, chomping at the bit, wanting to practice. Yeah. So to take away that from the kids, because I know a lot of the kids that I'm coaching right now, they talk about top division one tennis and professional tennis, their social life will dwindle more and more as they get older. I don't want to take that away from them. Uh, so finding that balance and giving them a weekend or two to do things with their friends. Right. Um, and that's why choosing the right tournaments for those two weekends is key. It's key. Uh, we understand that some of these kids have financial issues or Atlanta, you live here. I've never been in a city where academics is 
a bigger deal. Yeah. Like, I mean, like high school here in Atlanta, it's like you're talking about Ivy League, you know, like, yeah. so th these kids are not allowed to miss two, one or two days of school. So we need to make sure that we pick the right tournament. Um, but we're fortunate that right around us, you have Nake and you have Columbus, you have Rome with so many top tournaments. So they find that, 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 that good balance. Uh, but again, it's, it's hard to give you an exact answer because it is a case by case. You gotta sure. sit down. You gotta sit down with the kid and say, okay, you're playing your first year of 12. Okay. And some of these kids are like, oh, but I want to play 14s. Why do you want to play 14s? You know, are you dominating kids your age? Um, no. So are you just really trying to play 14s to release, relieve the, pre the, uh, the pressure? Okay. Which I think that's what it is. Oh, if you win, I beat a 14 year old. I'm 11. No, I, I feel like there's a reason why the USTA has created age groups, okay? Because, yeah. you know, like, unless you're really dominating your age and you are physically and mentally outside of the, the, the line, outside of the curve, then let's push you a little bit more. But when I feel like these kids go to a tournament their age and they're losing second round, then they lower the level. Oh, I'm not winning at a level four, 12s. Let me play a level six, 14s. What is really the advantage in that? You're playing a kid who is three years older than you, serving harder, physically stronger, mentally more mature. I don't really get it, you know, like so, so, but there are exceptions, right? And obviously in college, you, as a freshman, you're gonna play seniors. As I was just getting ready to say, I mean, you have that pressure in college tennis of playing people maybe six years older than you now with all the COVID stuff, right? And these are, you know, if you come in at 17, 18, not fully physically developed and certainly not fully mentally developed, um, you talk about pressure. I mean, that's enormous. So learning how to manage that type of pressure in the 12s, 14s, 16s, and 18s, right. that's a stepping stone to being ready to handle it when you get to college. For sure, for sure. And, you know, in college, you don't really get to decide whether you're playing a junior, or sophomore, or a senior, right? right? You're gonna play what comes your way. But again, I really feel like a lot of the things that are done on the junior side set the kids up for success or failure in the college world. So sure. yes, you, you need to learn. Are you playing? Are you playing higher, you know, age or level because you are ready to beat these kids? And that brings pressure or you're playing higher because that brings no pressure. Mm -hmm. So that's when, again, that's why it's a case by case. I have some players that when they play up, they feel a little bit more pressure. I want to expose them to that kind of situation. Sure. But I have a lot of players that feel more pressure playing down. What I do a lot, Lisa, is we do a lot of challenge matches during drills, you know, like let's, and I told them, I told them last week, listen, is it is really hard to really emulate the pressure that you feel in tournaments at practice. We try to the best of our ability to create competitive environments. So now every week that I know we're going to go through match play is going to be a UTR league. So mm -hmm. they're going to build. So whatever match I put out there. So now practice is going to, because the moment that they're able to practice like they play and play like the practice, we're on the right track. Yeah. So we're going to try to do that more and more often to make sure that I see how they react every day playing under pressure. That's awesome. That's really awesome. One other thing you touched on and, and I want to get back to is managing the pressure of social media. And you talked about the fact that at your academy, you have a sports psychologist on staff that works with the kids. And one of the aspects that she works on is social media pressure. Can I, and I know this isn't your area. I know you, you've got an expert there that handles it, but what are some of the things that you're seeing as a coach from the kids that you're working with that made you feel like it was necessary to bring in an expert to address this part of not tennis development per se, but just childhood development? Right, right. Well, I, I, I truly believe I see the results and I even see what social media does to me sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. So I see what it does to a 40 year old guy who is fully developed, you know, what is, what, what is it doing to a 10, 11, 12 year old boy or girl? So 
what these kids are doing, first of all, there's obviously benefits of being able to, to have access to everything that is happening all over the world. But most of these kids, they're seeing on social media things that are actually no reality. Mm. Okay. You know, you see some of these top players, whether it's junior or pro, they share on social media only the highs of their lives. Right. You know, and, and it's pictures of mansions and cars and kids wearing inappropriate outfits. Um, they, they only share their best results. So these kids are trying to, to recreate what these other players and sometimes opponents have, which to be honest, when you really dig in a little bit deeper, those kids don't really have that, all, only those highs all the time. Right. Actually, I've been around some of these people that would show only the surface of their life, but deep inside, it was a lot of struggles. Mm -hmm. um, and what it does, it actually makes our players try to become somebody they're not. Right. Uh, it makes them feel like failures when they're not even close to achieving some of those results that they're seeing on social media. They start taking, having lists of girls or boys that are their age and a lot higher on UTR or have a lot more followers. So I don't see any benefits for a teenager, especially an athlete right now in social media. I, I really don't. I really don't. I think there's a lot of benefits when it comes from the professional aspect. I use a lot of social media to promote the program. It's not something that I use for my personal life too much. Uh, I try to keep them away from it. I really do. Uh, and it is proven that social media is actually impacting and negatively uh, in, in causing negative effects in their brain development. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I don't know too much of the research behind Mm -hmm. uh, but it is causing, you know, you, you compare uh, motor skills and even like just maturity, you compare to some of the kids that grew up in our age when we were 10, 11, 12, 15, just playing outside, you know, growing up and kids that are now on social media and playing video games all the time. We're talking about uh, communication skills have gone down the drain, mm -hmm. okay, because these kids, they prefer to Snapchat or send text messages. Uh, when you when you confront them about an issue, they look down. They cannot look at you because they're not used to it. Uh, so all those things. How can you be an assertive athlete and put your foot down when you're playing a match and somebody's making a bad call and to say no, 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 I'm gonna put my foot down. But these kids, they actually now is struggling with confidence because they're not going through uh, real life exercises to build up that confidence. Right. You know, there's, there's no more confrontation among kids. I'm not talking about fights, but be able to, there's none of that anymore. Mm -hmm. Everything is cyberbullying. Yeah. Right. So, so that's why I want him to stay away from that. You know, I, I tell him all the time, you know, I want you guys, if you have an issue with a teammate, tell him, no gossiping, tell him. If you have an issue with me, tell me. Okay. So those things, one thing that we try to do quite often is right before practice starts, I'll just randomly pick an athlete. You're the captain today bring everybody in, give them a pep talk before we go out. Oh, and I, I love that. Whoa, 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 wait, wait, what, what? Yes. I'm not expecting you to be able to communicate with the players like the coaches do, but I don't want them to plan ahead because if they know they're going to be picked, they come with something memorized. Right. <laughs> and, and they're the captain. Well, for that and, day. or they tell their parent and the parent gets involved in the process and yes, takes the ownership yes. away from the player. Yes. And, and I tell them, right. as the captain, you're paying attention to kids that are not bringing it. You got to go, hey, you're not bringing it. So we're trying to the best of our ability to develop leaders for the world because I think as cliche as it sounds, if we don't do a very good job developing character, forget about the tennis. Forget about it. Okay, these kids will probably be done uh, with tennis very, very soon before even college or they're going to go to college and get in trouble as a freshman because the values are not there. Uh, and we know that when you get to a certain age, unfortunately, teenagers listen to friends and coaches more than parents, yeah. you know, it, especially, especially friends even more. So we try to keep our little circle protected from outside a little bit more and make sure that, that they can use what they're learning here in tournaments. So when other people see, they're like, wow, it's fun how these kids are pushing each other. They really care for each other. 
So I'm against social media. I know a lot of parents are too, but I know unfortunately that I see a lot of families to keep their kids quiet. Hey, go, here's the video game and social media. And I, I don't I don't know how good that is. Yeah, it's it's tough. And and what we're seeing now with name image likeness and college sports and you know now the NCAA has said that you know athletes can use name image likeness and earn some money to help support themselves during college and unfortunately some of those agreements some of those contracts or endorsements or whatever you want to call them are based on social media followings yeah. and so it is going to be a real tough balance in the next few years as we work through all of this but i i think what you're doing is really important marcelo and making sure that the kids understand how social media can impact not just the way they're feeling, but also their performance on the tennis court, in school, socially, with their families, whatever, um, is, is crucial. So um, kudos to you for, for focusing on that and making sure that the kids have the support they need. We're coming to the end of our hour. And before we do, I want to just give you the opportunity to share with our audience how they can find you, um, how they can get more information on Windy Hill High Performance Tennis, more information on Marcelo Ferreira. Um, so where should we send them? And, and we'll have links to all this in the show notes. So, so to everyone out there, you know, like you can, right now we actually just restructuring our website. So you wouldn't be able to find any information on it, you can reach out to me at marcelo.ferreira, M-A-R-C-E-L-O dot F as in Frank, E-R-R-E-I-R-A, 2310 at gmail.com. Or you can free, feel free to call me at 818-450-7836. And if you want to have some info on the program and just kind of have an idea of what we're doing, just follow me on Instagram, Coach Ferreira Tennis, um, and I post we were talking bad about social media, but remember <laughs> for, for businesses and academies, I think is a, is a good way to promote sure. what you're doing. So I'm a social media nut when it comes to that aspect, you guys can follow me on, on Instagram again, coach Ferreira tennis. Um, and to finish, you know, like I wanted to bring up something that is a little bit off topic, sure. but a lot of our tennis fans and tennis parents, I believe some of them are aware of, Tim Siegel and Luke Siegel and, you know, the uh, Team Luke Hopes for uh, Hope for Minds Foundation uh, is the only foundation in the country that takes care of children with brain injury. Tomorrow is a big day because it's the national day, uh, I believe, for children with brain injury. So there's a huge campaign that you, Lisa, you're supporting as well. Yes. So tomorrow you guys have the opportunity to donate and help is a is an incredible, noble cause. Tim and his board, they're doing an amazing job. They, they've helped hundreds and hundreds of families. Um, for those that are not aware, unfortunately, Luke left us uh, a few months ago. So now that cause has become even more powerful. We can, we really need to support, you know, the, the foundation to make sure that Luke's legacy gets carried on. So for I sure. just wanted to give Coach Siegel a shout out and make sure that everybody that has the opportunity tomorrow, Liz is gonna have a, a, um, a live, you know, live stream, just giving the opportunity for everybody to donate. Let's help y'all. I love that. Thank you, Marcelo. Thank you all, you know, like I'm, I'm from Atlanta now. Yeah, yeah, I love it, I love it. Um, and we'll have links to uh, the Team Hope, uh, Team Hope, Team Luke Hope for Minds. I, I'm terrible about getting that right. Team Luke Hope for Minds, uh, the link will be in the show notes on parentingaces.com. So for those of you who missed our Facebook Live with Tim Siegel and missed tomorrow's Facebook Live, um, you'll have the opportunity to click and donate all month. Uh, they are accepting donations. And Parenting Aces is adding a dollar to our donation for every one of you that makes a donation. So we just need you to shoot us an email or a DM and let us know that you've donated so we can make sure that our donation reflects that as well. Marcelo, such a pleasure to see you and chat with you and visit with you. Next time I'm in Atlanta, maybe we can hit and catch Please. up in person. Sure, Lisa. Thank you so much. Glad to see you doing so well. Say hello 
to everyone. Say hello to Morgan. Really proud of him for what he's doing. And thanks again for the opportunity. Hopefully we'll do it again soon. Absolutely. And to my listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll catch you next time on Parenting Aces. Bye-bye, guys.